There's a quote from uh, one of my English teachers at Lower Marion named uh, uh, Mr. Fisk. He had a great quote that said, rest at the end, not in the middle. And that's something I always live by. You know, I'm not going to rest. I'm going to keep on pushing now. There are a lot of answers that I don't have, even questions that I don't have. But I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going, and I'll figure these things out as we go. Right? And you just continue to build that way. So that, I try to live by that all the time. Salut à toutes, salut à tous. J'espère que vous allez bien. Comme vous l'avez vu dans le titre de la vidéo, aujourd'hui, je rends hommage à Kobe Bryant. Kobe, qui a été pour moi un mentor, même si je ne l'ai jamais rencontré. Et c'est aussi le père spirituel de cette chaîne Better Athlete qui est censé vous inspirer, qui est censé vous donner envie de toujours progresser. Et donc, Kobe Bryant, c'était un, un excellent orateur. C'était aussi euh, une personne qui savait se poser les bonnes questions, un peu à, à l'image d'un coach. Vous savez que, enfin, pour ceux qui ne savent pas, je suis coach mental, en plus d'être journaliste. Et, et c'est pour ça que je me suis dit que cette vidéo, elle était parfaite. Elle était parfaite pour perpétuer la légende et, et cette mentalité et cette éthique de travail de Kobe Bryant. Donc ce que j'ai fait, c'est que j'ai récupéré des extraits d'interviews que Kobe a donné pour Jay Shetty, pour Lewis House, pour Brian Harbinger et pour aussi euh, USC. Donc il a donné des conférences à USC et aussi pour le site Valuetainment. Donc cette vidéo, elle commence maintenant et ce sont les 24 leçons de la Mamba Mentality. And when I came back to the States, I wasn't the most athletic kid. You know, I was really scrawny, like really, really skinny and had like major knee issues. I had to look long term because in the here and now, I couldn't compete with these kids. I mean, there was kids that were like 12 years old with beards. Like I can't, <laughs> I can't what am I supposed to do with that? Like they're, they're doing windmills and dunking backwards and I'm happy to like tap the backboard, you know? So I had to look at it from a long term because I wasn't going to give up on the game. Because I wasn't going to catch these kids in a week. I wasn't going to catch them in a year, right? So that's when I sat down and said, okay, this is going to take some thought, right? Mm -hmm. What do I want to work on first? All right, shooting, all right, let's knock this out. Let's focus on this half a year, six months, do nothing but shoot, all right? After that, all right, creating your own shot. And then you focus, so you start, I started creating a menu of things. Mm. When I came back the next summer, I was a little bit better, right? And a I menu being like, I've got my jump shot from 15, I've got my Yeah, I got my jump away, shot from I've 15, got my... I got my three point shot, like just open shots, not miss open shots, right? right. And be able to shoot it with speed, because those kids are so much more athletic. Yeah. And then the next summer I came back, I was a little better. And the summer came back. And you the scored. Next summer, it was a little better. I scored. Yeah, you know, it wasn't much, right. but I scored. And this you know? is 12, 13. 12, 13. And then 14 came around, back half of 13, 14 uh, years old. And then I was just killing everyone. And it happened in two years. And I wasn't expecting it to happen in two years, but it did. Because what I had to do was work on the basics and the fundamentals. Well, they relied on their athleticism mm. and their natural ability. And because I stick to the fundamentals, it just caught up to them. And then my body, you know, my knees stopped hurting. I grew into my frame. And, and then your athleticism, once you have the fundamentals, exactly. the hard work, the mindset, and you tack on the athleticism, exactly. it's then, then, game then, over. Then it was game over. <laughs> wow. My father uh, was really influential at a really critical time where I, you know, I had a summer where I played basketball when I was like 10 or 11 years old in a very prominent summer league in Philadelphia called the Sunny Hill League. Where my father played, my uncle played, and they were like all time greats and yeah. that sort of stuff. And Will Chamberlain played in the league, you know, uh, Earl of Pro Monroe played in the league. And here I come playing, and I don't score one point the entire summer. Really? Not one. How old were you? 11, 10, 11. And you're playing against other 10, 11 year olds? Uh -huh. or, and you didn't score once? Not one. Were you in the game? I was in the game. How did you not score? Because I was terrible. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That At 10, 11 years old, you were that terrible. Awful. I mean, I, you know, and I had these big knee pads on because I was no. growing really fast. <laughs> I had socks all the way up here and I had like the pot top skinny, fade, yeah. like skinny as hell. And I scored not a free throw, not a nothing, not a lucky shot, not a breakaway layup, zero points. And I remember crying about it and being upset about it. And my father just gave me a hug and said, listen, whether you score zero or score 60, I'm going to love you no matter what. Wow. Now that is the most important thing that you can say to a child. Because from wow. there I was like, okay, that gives me all the confidence in the world to fail. I have the security there. But to hell with that, I'm scoring 60. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> right, right. Right. And from there I just went to work. And I just wow. I stayed with it and I kept practicing, kept practicing, kept practicing. And giving me confidence 
to say, okay, it's okay to fail because you're going to be loved no matter what. And that, that doesn't just mean basketball. That means anything in life. Yeah, that means writing. That means being an entrepreneur. That means um, having the confidence to go for it. And um, I've seen too many parents do the exact opposite. And it terrifies children. And children become paralyzed by their own fear because uh, they don't have that security blanket of love and comfort. Donc dans cet extrait, Kobe parle de l'importance fondamentale de l'amour inconditionnel de son père. Donc qu'il marquait 0 ou 60 points, c'était la même chose. Son père l'aimait de la même façon. Et bien en fait, vous pouvez vous inspirer de ça si vous n'avez pas cet amour inconditionnel de la part des autres, que ce soit vos parents, vos entraîneurs, vos amis, vos partenaires. Et bien vous pouvez utiliser cet amour inconditionnel, mais pour vous-même. C'est important que... Malgré euh, des, des mauvaises performances, vous ayez toujours euh, cet amour de vous. L'amour de vous, ce n'est pas de se prendre en selfie et, et de vous kiffer. Euh, non, ce n'est pas ça. L'amour de soi, c'est de se traiter comme son meilleur ami, même quand les choses euh, ne tournent pas à votre avantage. Donc que vous marquez 30 points, que vous ne marquez pas, que vous soyez performant ou non, aimez-vous de la même façon. C'est-à-dire traitez-vous comme euh, vous aimeriez qu'un ami vous traite ou un parent vous traite dans ces conditions. Voilà, c'est ça l'amour inconditionnel. And so like the consistency of work, Monday, get better, Tuesday, get better, Wednesday, get better, right? And you do that over a period of time, you know, not like one month or two months. I mean, it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And then, you you know, you can get to where you want to go. Yeah, I, I, can't I think it was Bill Gates who was talking about that. He talks about how like we, we overestimate what we can do in one year and underestimate what we can do in 10 years. No doubt. Right? Like, it's like that, you <laughs> no know. No doubt. I think it's important for athletes to own what it is that they're going through. It's awareness, right? I think a lot of times we try to tell children, tell young athletes in particular, um, that if you have those thoughts and those feelings, that's weakness. That's bad. You shouldn't be feeling that, which then causes them to right, feel some type of way about themselves, right? And they carry that around with them for the rest of their lives. And I think the most important thing is for us to be aware of what's going on in here. Not that it's bad, good, or indifferent, but it's awareness. And once you're aware of it, then you can choose to walk hand in hand with it, or you can choose to fight it, but you're making that decision. If you just can constantly bury that in the distance, then it starts festering, and it comes up in different ways and manifests itself in different ways. Uh, what I've learned at an early age is you accept them versus fight them. You know, like if you're nervous or scared about a situation, instead of being like, nah, there's nothing to be scared about, nothing to be scared about. Oh shit, there is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's fine. That's okay. You know, like you own it, you give it a hug, <laughs> you embrace it, and now what are you going to do about it? You know, I, what I try to do is just try to be still mm. and understand that things come and go. Emotions come and go. The important thing is to accept them all, to embrace them all. And then you can choose to do with them what you want mm. versus being controlled by emotion. You know, a lot of times I've seen players, even myself, you know, when I was younger, being consumed by a particular fear um, and to the point where you're saying, okay, nah, it's it's not good to feel fear. I shouldn't be nervous in this situation. Like, nah. And it does nothing but grow versus stepping back and saying, yeah, I, I am nervous about the situation. Yeah, I am fearful about the situation. Well, what am I afraid of? And then you kind of unpack it. Mm. And then it gives you the ability to look at it for really what it is, which is nothing more than your imagination <laughs> running its course you know it's not it's not really a thing yeah. you know like you, you think about game winning shots and or game winning free throws and people go to the free throw line and they're nervous about it well what are you really nervous about if you unpack that okay you, you're nervous that you're going to miss the shot all right so you missed the shot then what happens people are going to be embarrassed you're going to be embarrassed because thousands of people millions of people see you missed the shot all right and then what people are going to talk bad about you okay Right. And so you're looking at it and you go, are those things even important? <laughs> you know what I mean? If that, if that is my fear, like what, what is, you worried about letting your teammates down? Okay. Have you let them down before? Well, I'm sure. And practice and things of that nature, right? They're still there. Yeah. You know? And so when you're able to unpack it, you kind of look at it for what it is, which is really nothing. Don't hide from it. You know, you got to be able to look at it and, you know, and, and, and deal with it head on. There was a, there was a year played um, Indiana Pacers in the finals. I rolled my ankle really bad. Jalen Rose stepped under me on purpose. Uh -huh. He admits it now, finally. And rolled uh -huh. my ankle really, really bad. I came back, finished the series, um, but I couldn't touch a basketball until mid-September, 
which was driving me crazy because I couldn't train. Mm -hmm. But I looked at, this was like the 10th time I rolled my ankle in one season. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, I got to address that. And so be, being that I couldn't get on the basketball court, um, what I did was I took tap dancing lessons. <laughs> okay. No kidding. I took Absolutely. tap. And tap was like the best training for me in the world because it strengthened my feet. It changed my rhythm and my approach to the game. I was able to change speeds when I came back the following season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think dancers um, put way more strain on their body than athletes do. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from that. My daughter took ballet for several years, and I would sit there in the class, right? And I didn't know what I was getting into because I don't know anything about ballet, right? But I'm sitting there in the class, and I'm watching her, and I'm watching her get the first position, the second position, and I'm, start, I'm learning the structure and the rules that go along with that. Mm -hmm. And as athletes, there's a lot to be learned from that. Because if you simply go out there and perform and play, yeah, you'll be great every now and then. But if you play with structure, if you understand the rules that come along with that, the discipline that comes along with that, then you reach another level. Well, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything, everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. So Growing up, you know, they instilled in me the importance of imagination, of curiosity, and understanding that, okay, if you want to accomplish something, I'm not just going to sit here and say, yes, you can do whatever you want. Mm. Yes, you can, but you have to also put in the work to get there, right? So they taught me that at a really early age, man. And uh, when you grow up as a kid thinking that the world is your oyster, and all things are possible if you put in the work to do it, you know, you grow up having that fundamental belief. I have dreams and... You know, dreams is, um, they should be pure. And I, and I think a lot of times, you know, when we're born into this world, we actually wind up going backwards. And it seems like the more we mature, uh, the more responsible our dreams become. And the more governors we put on ourselves and our ability to dream and to reimagine. And it's always a fight for us parents and, you know, and for you guys to make sure that your dreams always stay pure. And so it's not a matter of, of um, of pushing beyond your limitations or expectations. It's really a matter of protecting your dreams, protecting your imagination. That's really the key. And when you do that, then the world just seems limitless. You're, you're out running on a track, working out, and you start talking to yourself saying, man, my, my knee is really sore right now. Maybe I'm Maybe I'm doing too much. Sounds like me. Maybe I need to back off, you know. <laughs> Man, my lungs are burning. Am I, maybe I can just slow down here. I'll do like an extra two sets tomorrow. You know, it'll be okay. Yeah. Right? That sort of stuff. Yes. Like that stuff's dangerous. Yes. And that's when you just got to say, you know what? I'm not negotiating with myself. Yeah. The deal was already made. The deal was made. When I set out at the beginning of the summer and said, this is the training plan I'm doing. I signed that contract with myself. I'm doing it. Mm. You know, throughout the that process, you'll start talking to yourself like, man, I got to, I think I need to, maybe if we, nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is no non-negotiable. Yeah, non-negotiable. <laughs> yeah. Like if, you, if you're thinking about how often kids are playing, mm -hmm. right? I tell this to my, to my daughter and my daughter's team as well that I coach. So it's a simple thing of math. If you want to be a great player, if you play every single day, two, three hours, every single day, over the course of a year, how much better are you getting? Most kids will play maybe, you know, an hour and a half, two days a week. Right. Do the math season, on that. It's not, it's, not going, it's not going to get it done. <laughs> not going to get it done. Right. So if you're obsessive, obsessive, obsessively training two, three hours every single day over a year, over two years, you're already accelerating. You make quantum leaps, man. <laughs> because as, as a young kid, when I came in the league, it was like, I'm driving this way and either you're gonna be on the train or be on the track, <laughs> right? Where there was no such thing as understanding that people have lives outside of the game, <laughs> which, which you know, I, apparently I did not. Um, but like if I understood that at an early age, and I, it, it helps me as a leader to communicate better. I came to understand that later um, and um, getting to know people on a personal level. Um, 
what are their fears, what are their insecurities, right? what are their dreams and ambitions, desires, those sorts of things. When you come to understand that about a person, then you can help them reach the best version of themselves. So I wish I'd known that earlier. Um, I had a teammate that, that uh, spoke to me and said, hey, Cole, you know, I just want to feel like as a teammate, you need me. I was like, well, duh. I, I, I can't, I can't, you know, <laughs> like that was my immediate reaction. I was like, dude, yeah, of course. But I had to kind of think about really what he was saying and where that was coming from for him mm. and his story and his journey and what that meant to him. And that opened my eyes to there's a bigger game being played. It's not just basketball, but it's the emotions of each individual and the backstory that they're carrying with them, the baggage that they're carrying with them. And if I really want to be a champion and be a great teammate, I have to understand what those mean to help them become better and in turn help me. I think you have to, you have to listen and you have to uh, pay attention to, to what your colleagues or teammates are saying and what are certain things that drive them certain things that motivate them, that trigger them. Because then you know what nerve to touch. Some guys, it's like, okay, come on, let's, you know, we can do this, that'll get them going. Other guys, no. You gotta figure out what button to push. You know, Powell was always Spain. If I tell them how they lost in a gold medal to us and how they're gonna lose again, how I'm gonna beat your ass in practice, just like I beat you in a gold medal game, oh, that, oh he would hate that. <laughs> He'd hate that. But that's what practice was. You have to drive them. You absolutely have to. And if practice is more intense and harder than a game seven will be, then a game seven will be easy. But if it's not, then that's when teams start folding and capitulating. I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. At, at what age did that goal become crystal clear? That I, made, that's what I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. At 13 years 13 old? 13 years old. That's the deal I made. crystal clear about it? Crystal clear. And where did inspiration come from? Um, the love of the game. The love of the game. The challenge. Like, I, I would watch Magic play. I'd watch Michael play. And I would see them do these unbelievable things. And I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Let's find out. And so that curiosity to see where I could push this thing led me down that path, I think. So like in, at 13 years old, you know, I played the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13. It was to be better than you when, you know, the chips are really on, on the line. So when we played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it? Right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths. I'd play to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you going to get better? Right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths. Why? Because you want to win. Right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game. Right? So I have a strategy. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17 and my game is completely well rounded and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17. Mm -hmm. Now you got a problem. I, I, at the time I deal with what I've referred to as Goat Mountain. I went to Goat Mountain. And I talked to Magic, Michael, Bird, Kim Olajuwon, Jerry West, Oscar Robinson, Bill Russell. You know, so I would talk to them. What did you do? What were your experiences? Michael in particular, he's become my big brother. He's been my big brother since I first came in the league. And what was that process like? And so I went to them and started understanding the ins and outs of the game and you know, how they approach things and their level of detail and obsessiveness. Because and... I asked a lot of questions. You know, playing with Byron Scott, I asked him a lot of questions. Eddie Jones, who was great at chasing guards off the screens, and I didn't understand how to do that. I would sit with him before practice, after practice. Um, Magic, um, James Worthy, Kurt Rambis, Kareem Abdul, all the Laker greats, I would always sit down and just ask him questions. 
about certain games that I studied growing up. What actually happened there? What did you feel there? Why? You know, bird tough to defend. Why? Because you look slow as shit to me. So he's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm missing something. So like, tell me what I'm missing. You know what I mean? And so I would always ask questions and try to learn as much as I could. Because what I found in the NBA is a lot of guys played for financial stability. And when they came to the NBA, they got that financial stability. So therefore, the passion and the work ethic and the, obsession, the obsessiveness was gone. So I'm looking at that. I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be like taking candy from a baby. And I wonder Mike wins all these fucking championships. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Of and, 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 like, and, and then you had the players that had that passion but weren't willing to commit their entire lives to doing that, right? It's a choice, right? You have other things. You have family. You have all these other things that you have to do. The game can't really be your number one priority. Like, I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends. And they'll just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out. Like, I, I, I'm not, I never did that. But why, it was a why choice. Not, why, why, why didn't you do that? What, well, because when I retire, I didn't want to have to say, I wish I would have done more. I don't want that. You know? I don't want that. And we talk about hard work all the time. It's like, you know, man, if you got to get up every single morning and remind yourself how hard you need to work, you probably need to choose a different profession. You know? Because that shouldn't be there. I wake up in the morning excited to get to it. You know, if I'm not training, I'm missing it. I'm not watching a game of basketball. I miss it. I, you know, there's no place I'd rather be. And if you have that feeling, then you're truly doing what God has put you on this earth to do. I tell you, like when we, when I was in high school, um, and uh, I used to work out with the 76ers. I used to ask them, you know, what's it like to guard Mike? You go, Mike? You mean Black Jesus? I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Black who? Oh, we call him Black Jesus. Or you can call him Black Cat. I'm like, I'm going to call him fucking Mike. That's his fucking name. <laughs> so the level of fear that he inspired in others was insane. Wow. And I would tell him, I said, when I face him, we're going to go at it. He says, oh, you don't want to do that. I'm like, what? Man, you don't know me, man. And so when we matched up, I think he understood that. And, you know, when I was 18, my first year, he got the best of me a bunch of times. I was right there the next play. You're not intimidating me. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. And I think he saw that level of respect because I think he was the same way at 18 years old. And that common bond is, is what I think, uh, you know, where our connection was built. Middle school and high school. Because a lot of the kids that I was playing against were inner city kids. Yeah. And so you're looking at me as if, okay, this kid's soft. Right. He's from the suburbs of Philadelphia. His father played in the NBA, played professionally. He's got it easy. Got it easy, born on second, you know, all this other stuff, right? And so it felt like they could try to be physical or try to intimidate me and do all this other stuff, which they couldn't, right? But now I'm saying, okay, well, you're trying to attack me. How am I going to attack you? How can I mentally figure out ways to break, break you down? How can I show you that, no, I have the edge, right? And so that's when it first started for me is figuring out how to get the upper hand on an opponent that way. You got to look at the reality of the situation. You know, like for me, it's not, you know, you, you kind of got to get over yourself. Like, it's not about you, man. Like, oh, okay, you feel embarrassed. You're not that important. Like, <laughs> get over yourself. Yeah, that's where you go. Get over yourself, right? Like, you're worried about how people may perceive you, and like, you're walking around, and it's embarrassing because you shot five air balls. Get over yourself. Right? And then after that, it's okay, well, why did those air balls happen? Got it. High school, year before, we played 35 games, max, right? Week in between, spaced mm -hmm. out, plenty of time to rest. In the NBA, it's back to back to back to back to back to back to back. I didn't have the legs. So you look at the shot, every shot was online, every shot was online, but every shot was short. Right? I got to get stronger. Uh, I got to train differently. The weight training program that I'm doing, I got to tailor it for an 82-game season mm -hmm. so that when the playoffs come around, my legs are stronger and that ball gets there. So I look at it with rationale and say, okay, well, the reason why I shot air balls is because my legs aren't there. I go, well, next year they'll be there. One of our coaches in the past, his name is Tex Winter, 
when we used to watch game film, he was pretty brutal on us as players. Yeah. But he always said, I'm not criticizing the person, I'm criticizing the act. Mm-hmm. Right. So remove yourself from that. Remove the ego from this process and just focus on the act. The goal is to help us all become better. And when you do that, you can kind of remove yourself from that. Now you can look at actions and then you can truly improve, you know, as a basketball player. I mean, every day, I mean, since, you know, 20 years, I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Now, my vertical was a 40, it wasn't a 46 or a mm-hmm. 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive. Right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them so your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast. Right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it, though. So, like, from the time I was, I can't remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game, mm. and it just never changed. So there, there are very tactical things in terms of footwork and geometry of the court. So you're looking at the court and looking at the 45-degree angles that the court is, is shaped in and how it needs to operate. That's one component to it. So looking at spots on the floor where you can increase your efficiency, Right. You can be on the wing, but there's a certain spot on the wing that improves your angle to drive to the basket. Right? So that sort of stuff. Footwork of the opposition, looking at the emotion of the opposition, their tendencies, their weaknesses, and all that stuff. Understanding the momentum of the game, how to create momentum shifts, where momentum shifts come from, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then studying outside of that, right? looking at different industries, looking at... Uh, conductors, looking at writers, looking at actors and how they get into character and then how do they keep themselves in that mental space. So um, looking at different different industries, looking at nature itself mm. and learning from that and how you can incorporate that into the game. It, I, I, man, it's, it's a lot of studying. If we're talking about, you know, a basketball decision where, you know, you've got to, um, you know, read a certain coverage or something like that. I mean, a lot of that comes from the, the pre-work pre-work and understanding what their defensive package is and uh, how to put teammates in certain situations. So, for example, if you look at players nowadays that are charged with taking game-winning shots or making game-winning decisions, Mm -hmm. and you look at the play and then you look at it and say, okay, well, that shooter was there, the double team came, and, you know, the player couldn't do anything but pass the ball, right? Well, that's because they didn't do the pre-work. Right? So when you do the pre-work, you understand, okay, this team in a situation likes to run a double team from this particular angle. All right, so I'm going to clear that side out, force the double team to come from a different angle, move myself to a space on the floor where it's going to take a long time for the double team to come, and now I can circumvent the double team and get to a place on the floor where I can knock down a shot and get to the basket. So it's, it's all that pre-work. Uh, you know, I, I, use this, I, I tell this example and I think this is the best way to explain it. Um, you know, you have a, a hamstring injury, you pull your hamstring really, really badly, you can barely walk, right? Let alone play anything. Soccer, basketball, volleyball, whatever it is, you can't do anything. Doctor tells you go home, sit up on the couch, rest your hammy, right? Stay off of it, don't get up, no sudden movements. You're at home, all of a sudden a, a fire breaks out in the home, right? Your kids are upstairs, you know, wife is you know, wherever she may be, you know, shit's going down, all right? I'm willing to bet that you're going to forget about your hamstring, you're going to sprint upstairs, you're going to grab your kids, you know, make sure your wife's good, you're getting out of that house, right? <laughs> hamstring be damned. You're not going to feel your hamstring, right? And, and the reason is because the lives of your family are more important than the injury of your hamstring. And so when the game is more important than the injury itself, you don't feel that damn injury. Mm. Not at that time. I bought into the meditation. I bought into the deeper connection that exists within the game. And so when you watch our teams, or you watch any of Phil's teams, or Chicago teams, game six against Utah, you watch our games, you know, Game seven against Boston, we were never rattled, ever. 
because we're always in the moment, always in the present, always extremely calm, always looking at the reality of the situation and not letting our emotions cloud our execution. And that comes from being in that meditative state that he would teach and preach from day one. And for the 81 point game, man, to be honest, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about the game. My knee was hurting so much. Um, I didn't know then, but you know, I had a flap of joint uh, of cartilage stuck in my joint line. And so my mind was really trying to go to a place where I don't feel that pain. And uh, the game started, and because of that, I was just in a different space. You know, I wasn't worried about what was to come. I wasn't worried about what just happened. I was just here. And when you're just there in the moment, playing plays right in front of you, your focus is heightened because nothing else matters. Um, and uh, that's the space I've tried to get to. It's a good separation for me, you know, emotionally, to be able to put myself in a place where at practice or when I'm training or during games, I switch my mind to something else switch my mode into something else, right? For me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt, it's go time, right? So that was my mental switch. It was like an actor getting ready for a film. You gotta put yourself in that cage. When you're in that cage, you are that character. And then when you leave there, it's something completely different. But when I'm in that cage, bro, don't fucking touch me, don't talk to me. Just <laughs> Leave me alone. I, there used to be certain games, like, for, like, certain key games. Uh, I don't think I've ever said this before. This, this kind of makes me seem very psychotic, but whatever. I used to uh, play the Halloween theme song over and over and over in my headphones. Pre-game. Seriously. 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 And it was important that it was Michael Myers because the mask itself was void of emotion. Void of emotion. It has That's nothing to do with pressure, it has level. nothing to do with hype, has nothing to do with camaraderie, it's stone cold killer. And I would listen to that song over and over and over wow. to get, that's, that's when you know you better run, because. <laughs> that's what a lot of people did. Yeah, it's probably coming out. You know, it's going to be a tough night. Story. Yeah. Donc vous l'avez vu dans cet extrait, Kobe parle de ses différentes personnalités et comment il devenait un tueur lors de ses matchs. Bien sûr que Kobe, dans la vie de tous les jours, n'était pas comme ça, mais il arrivait à actionner ce mode quand il était en compétition. Et quand on parle de différentes, quand je parle de différentes personnalités, ce n'est pas de la schizophrénie, c'est qu'on a tous différentes personnalités selon le contexte. Si je prends mon exemple, alors moi j'ai plusieurs professions que je fais, je travaille chez Foot Mercato et quand je suis en mode journaliste, ben, je ne suis pas du tout dans le même état d'esprit que quand je fais des vidéos pour Better Athlete. Parce que pour Foot Mercato, je vais être beaucoup plus léger, je vais laisser parler mon humour. Par contre, quand je suis sur Better Athlete, je vais être beaucoup plus sérieux. Donc là, j'active un, un autre mode. Et quand euh, j'exerce la profession de coach, et ben pareil, je suis dans un autre état d'esprit. Donc je vais switcher de personnalité. Et en fait, c'est ça, avoir différentes personnalités et pouvoir switcher selon le contexte. Donc switcher d'état d'esprit et de se mettre dans un autre mode, c'est quelque chose qui se travaille. Les athlètes arrive à le faire plus facilement, les, les grands athlètes arrivent à le faire plus facilement. Et moi, par exemple, en coaching, je travaille avec des athlètes qui n'arrivent pas forcément à se mettre dans ce mode-là. Donc, sachez que c'est une chose qui peut se travailler. It sucks to lose. Right. But at the same time, there are answers there, if you just look at them. Um, Because you get the information from losing more than from winning, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the answers are there when you win, too. You, 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 you just have to look at them, yeah. right? So it's a constant process. It's exciting when you win. It's exciting when you lose because the process should be exactly the same, whether you win or you lose. As you go back and you look and you find things that you could have done better, you find things that you've done well that worked, you figure out how did they work, why did they work, how can you make them work again. Yeah. And, uh, but the hardest thing is to face that stuff. Um, That's a really, really tough challenge. You mean I'll give you an example. So uh, Katie Lou Samuelson is one of the best college basketball players in the country. She plays at UConn. She's going to be a senior. Right now. Right now. Yeah. And uh, she's from Huntington Beach out here by us. And so she comes down and she works with some of my, my, my girls on the team and she helps coach. And, yeah. and uh, they just had a really tough season last year where they lost to Notre Dame in the final. That's right. Really yeah. tough. First loss in like First loss. years, right? Yeah. And so I asked her, I said, have you watched the Notre Dame game? She was like, no. I said, well, why not? I said, I don't want to watch that. I said, I know you don't, but you're going to play Notre Dame this year, yeah? Yeah. 
what's the chances you see him again in the final? I said, well, you probably see him again. I said, well, you can't show up and play them without knowing why you lost that one, right? So, you know, it, it, the mistakes that you've made in that game, you have to do the hard stuff and watch that game and study that game to not make those mistakes over and over again just because you weren't brave enough to face it. So she came down to the office. I brought her down to the office and we sat down and we watched that game together. Wow. Right? And you got to got to deal with face it. it. Got to deal with it. Face it, learn from it. Wow. Right? You're looking at it and say, oh, there's the mismatch. Oh, there's the gap. Uh, you know, and all those little things and it sucks. But, but you don't want to have that feeling again, do you? Right? So you got to really study it, face it. And uh, not to say you'll win the next time you face, but at least you'll, you'll give yourself a better, a yeah. better chance. Yeah. yeah. You gotta learn, man. I mean, yeah. Beyonce's the same, same thing. Really? After a performance, she's immediately on her laptop rewatching the performance. No way. Yes, seeing how to do things better. What could we have done differently? Right? I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an obsessiveness that comes along with it. You want things to be as perfect as they can be, understanding that nothing is ever perfect. But the challenge is try to get them as perfect as they can be. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? It's in your control. So control what you can. Yeah. I can watch film all day long. It's going to help me get better. Know. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you grow up and you make game winning shots and it's awesome. You come back the next day and miss a game winning shot and it's misery. And then the next day comes and you're back playing again. And you understand that life has this cyclical nature where it's, you know, what you do on Monday is fantastic, but then Tuesday is a bad day. But guess what? There's Wednesday. Yeah. So are we just supposed to live our lives like this the whole time? <laughs> you know, yeah. versus just staying like this and understanding that it's really just a journey of evolution every day. It's just constant improvement, constant curiosity, constantly getting better. The results don't really matter. Uh, it's the figuring out that matters. Like, I've seen a lot of players, um, especially now, you know, in, in youth basketball dealing with that. Um, you have players that are like bigger and faster and stronger and, you know, their coaches are just coaching them for results. You know, we're just going to use your size that because you're bigger than every other 12 year old out there to dominate today. And, and, but they're not growing. Mm. Right. So they're just based on that result, but they're not focused on growing this young child yeah. into becoming a better athlete. And, and through that, teaching them how to become a more well-rounded person. And we're missing that. It's, it's, I think the best way to prove your, your value is to work, is to learn, is to absorb, um, to be a sponge. Right? But you always want to outwork your potential. You know, as hard as you believe you can work, you can work harder than that. And that's what I tried to do when I first came in the league. But you know, basketball is such a direct competition sport that me coming in at 17, I hated when like my teammates would say, you know, I get hit with an elbow, right? Shaq would hit me with an elbow in practice. And like, you know, <laughs> you know Nick Van Exel would come up and say, are you okay? I'm like, motherfucker, what? <laughs> hey, Ma, are you okay? <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? You know, so like I always had that extra chip on my shoulder. So like every day in practice for me was really trying to annihilate everybody that, was, that I was playing against. Because I wanted to prove you don't need to babysit me. Like, I, I'm fine, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so it's always um, you know, that competitive nature, the work ethic, and curiosity. Um, you know, you're playing with Rajon Rondo, Paul Pierce, mm -hmm. Kevin Garnett, mm, all -stars. Ray Allen, and you know, it was myself, Powell, and the players that other teams didn't want. And you know, how do we figure out as a group what to do and the reason why I love that series so much is that we went down three games to two against Boston. And now you got two games coming home. I remember sitting in the locker room and they beat the crap out of us to that game. So we're sitting in the locker room and it's really, really quiet. And I'm sitting there looking around and we just lost the Celtics in 08. So this is like revenge, right? And they're kicking our butt again, right? So I sit around and I just started laughing. I started laughing and then I remember uh, Derek Fisher looked at me like, and Lamar looked at me and goes, what? What is funny? I said, dude, they beat the crap out of us. <laughs> they just beat the crap out. I said, I'm, I'm missing the part where that's funny. I said, man, listen, if we start this season and they say, you know, all you have to do is win two games at home and you're NBA champ, would you take that? Yeah. And like, right. Yeah, that's, right. That's all we got to do. Yeah. Go Down home, three, two. win two, we're NBA champions. All we got to do is win two, two games in a row. That's it. 
will take care of the first game, and I promise you they're not winning game seven on our home floor. It's wow. not happening. And so we all just laughed about it, and then we went out and we figured it out. But that game seven was – we're down 15 points in the fourth quarter, right? And that's when you have to collectively look at each other and say, you know, the spirit of your team must be good because at that moment is when teams fracture. And if the energy amongst each other isn't there, that trust isn't there, you're done. Mm. And we were able to collectively dig deep together and say, all right, we're going to figure this thing out. Wow. And I wasn't playing well. I wasn't shooting the ball well at all. Um, and so my teammates picked you up and they delivered. Yes. Yeah. You know, sports is the greatest, greatest metaphor we have in terms of dealing with life. Because, you know, even if you listen to music, music will give you guidance, mm -hmm. right? That you can then meditate on and think about how you would apply it. In sports, you have to apply it in the here and now. I mean, you're faced with challenges moment to moment. You're faced with pressures and anxiety and communication or the lack thereof and all this other stuff. Like, it's in the moment. So you have to live it. And when you practice those things, you become better at it. But I just mm -hmm. feel like in this day and age, our children have become less imaginative about how to problem solve and parents and coaches have become more directive uh, in trying to mandate or give orders or teach kids how to think and teach kids how to behave versus and tell them how to behave versus teaching them how to behave. Like I had a parent who was encouraging his daughter. You know, he's running 17s and he's encouraging her. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Dig deep, dig deep. And then after practice, I go to him and say, you know, when she's doing those line drills, don't say anything. Because there's a con there's a conversation that's happening inside of her head. She's like talking to herself, trying to pump herself up to do it. She's already having those conversations. So for an outside voice to come in, to give her guidance and to give her uh, the 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 kind of the, the the push to keep going actually interrupts her process. Just let her be. Let her figure it out herself. Uh, because as they go through life, as parents, we're not going to be there all the time. You know what I mean? So kids have to be able to navigate those things themselves. Um, I think the definition of greatness is to inspire the people next to you. Yeah, I, I think that's what greatness is or should be. It's, it's not something that's, that, that lives and dies with one person. Hmm. It's how can you inspire a person to then in turn inspire another person that yeah. then inspires another person. And that's how you create something that I think lasts forever. Yeah. And uh, I think that's our challenge as people, is to, um, is to figure out how our story can impact others and mm. motivate them in a way to create their own greatness. So how can we teach our children what it means to work hard? Well, you do it through training, right? So when I get up in the morning, my daughter goes with me. 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. My 15-year-old goes with me. Wow. She goes with me before school, and it becomes a daddy-daughter thing. That's cool. She just got a permit. Right? So she drives in the morning, it becomes a cool thing. Right? But through that process, she understands the value of hard work and things taking time. And the same thing with my 12 year old, right? she practices every day. Right? And so it's through those behaviors uh, um, is where I find the motivation to mm. do it. Mm. Yeah. C'est tout pour les 24 leçons de la Mamba Mentality. J'espère que cette vidéo vous a parlé, vous a inspiré. Et j'aimerais ajouter une chose très importante. Le but de cette vidéo, ce n'est pas de copier Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant est unique en son genre. Il est très difficile, c'est comme un idéal, c'est difficile d'atteindre un idéal. Et en fait, Kobe Bryant, sur certains points, il y avait également des excès. Euh, dans le coaching, on parle des drivers ou des messages contraignants. Et Kobe, il était un peu à la limite de ces, de ces messages contraignants. Le « soit fort » quand il avait mal et qu'il il continuait à jouer malgré la douleur, c'était très dangereux. D'ailleurs, son corps a lâché quand il s'est rompu le, le, le tendon d'Achille. Donc, il y, a des, il y a des choses qui sont à prendre, il y a des choses qui sont à laisser. Mais ce qui est très important, c'est d'être aussi honnête avec soi-même et de comprendre, OK, qu'est-ce qui me pousse à jouer au basket Pourquoi je fais ça Est-ce que j'aime vraiment ça Est-ce que je fais ça pour qu'on m'aime il, il y a plein de, de petites questions à se poser comme ça. Et, et, et dans la vie, même dans le, dans le sport, il faut savoir se poser les bonnes questions. Et Kobe, à travers cette vidéo, en fait, il parle de ça. Il parle de se poser toujours les bonnes questions et de faire les choses par amour et par passion. Donc j'espère que cette vidéo vous a plu. Si vous êtes intéressé par le coaching mental et pour avoir plus d'informations, j'ai laissé le lien de mon site perso donc dans la description. Et n'hésitez pas à laisser des commentaires, à suivre aussi cette chaîne si vous n'êtes pas encore abonné. Moi, je vous donne rendez-vous bientôt sur cette chaîne pour des nouvelles vidéos basket sur Better Athlete. À bientôt.